Good evening, folks. November the 1st. Did I get it right? All Saints. Happy New Month. Happy, yeah, whatever it is, 2018. <laughs> Great day today. Guy called me this morning and said, listen, I am completely confused. All these different religions. Help me understand. And so I led him to the Lord over the phone. It took me about 20 minutes. And said, William, happy birthday. Welcome to the family. That's what we're here for. You mentioned baptism. I think we've had 34 baptized here now at Dinosaur Adventure Land. So if you've given your heart to the Lord, haven't been baptized, come on down. We got a lake. It's probably a little chilly now. I haven't checked it. Jeff, you been in there? Not lately. Not little. <laughs> Have you seen them baptize the Russians through the ice? Would they do that? Unreal. Cut a hole in the ice and dip them in and pull them out. It's, it's amazing. We're going to finish, or if not finish, we're going to do part four tonight of uh, uh, Mr. Nelson's uh, uh, diatribe that we'll be dissecting a line at a time. This is perfect. I bet he's sorry he agreed to this where I could shut him off word at a time. And answer it. But uh, I've got a couple prayer requests first. Let's see. First of all, Philip, you took the tour on the four wheeler and did not get the certificate. Is that right? That's correct. And you work for the Sheriff's Department in Kentucky? Alabama. Or Alabama. Okay, good. Here you go, brother. And anybody else get the tour and did not get the certificate? You, Jim, you took the tour today. I did. And Bill? You already got a certificate? Okay, there you go. Give that to Jim. Good to have you here. Bill, been a longtime friend of mine. Known him since. Uh, well, I taught the college and career class in California, and Bill was in the Air Force out there and uh, came to the class, and we had a great time, became close friends. Anybody else not get the certificate? You did not yet, brother? John, here you go. Give one to John there. All right. Good, good. If you want to come down, take the tour, you got to get, take the tour first. Get this, this place is amazing to see, isn't it? Okay, a couple of prayer requests. They are killing about five white farmers a week in South Africa. It is going crazy over there, so be praying for that. And we're going to pray for that in a minute. Someone sent me the article. Thousands of Swedes are inserting microchips under their skin. What? Revelation 13, 16, in a nutshell. Okay. Pray for Miriam, who has cancer. I'll be glad to pray, but Miriam, you need to call Bill Sardi. There may be a nutritional help for that. 909-593-9501. Uh, <clears throat> if you have any health issues at all, Bill's the smartest guy I've ever met on nutrition and health and vitamins and minerals, and he may be able to offer some help on that. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for letting us be part of your family. I pray for Miriam, Lord. Give her wisdom what to do. I pray for the folks in South Africa, Lord. What a mess over there. And for the Swedes, Father, the Swedish Christians now, and those in India, where they're starting to force this microchip technology on people. Lord, please give them wisdom. Show them what to do. <clears throat> Please guide our Bible study tonight as we talk about your amazing creation and try to refute some of the things that are being taught by skeptics and scoffers. Please guide us now, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. One person texted me and said, Why are you wasting time on uh, Mr. Nelson, who calls himself Aaron Ra, after the Egyptian god Ra? <clears throat> I said, Well, how many millions of students in America and around the world face professors just like this? And it's worth taking a couple days out of our schedule here to say, okay, let's, let's just stop, slow down, and analyze this piece by piece to give them some information, some evidence, uh, some ammunition to fight back. So, <clears throat> Mr. Ra, you left off uh, last time. The deal was you would give a, I said, I just simply said, would you give the three best evidences for evolution? And then we will talk about them one at a time. Now, how that escaped you that you can't do three things and do them one at a time, I don't understand, but it apparently escaped you, so I'll explain it to you. We'll do one first, and then we'll do two second, and then we'll do three third. Okay, so you left off saying, <clears throat> you left off saying microevolution is just, uh, or speciation is macroevolution. This is ludicrous. We're going to continue here now with what he's been saying. Uh, let's see, get this, got everything working? and refutes your own notion of created kinds. To answer your question, butterflies are modified moths. Well, now hold on just a minute. Here's what happens with your raw rat run. You go on to 50 different topics and use all these big words, and it's real nice to have a pause button so that people can understand. This is what professors do to their students all day long. The students can frantically take notes and keep up. They don't have time to ask any questions. And by the time they're ready to ask a question, they're on to 40 more topics. So. Butterflies are modified moths. Well, let's talk about that just for a minute. Let's see, Bill, good to have you here, Jim. Let's see, Alt-DV, I think I got it. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> to answer your question, you said butterflies are modified moths. No, Mr. Nelson, they are not. 
And you certainly do, cannot, should not teach this nonsense to anyone at taxpayer expense. <clears throat> the most obvious difference is in the feelers on a mutter, butterfly and a moth. The antenna. Most butterflies have thin, slender filaments, antenna, which are club-shaped at the end. Moths, on the other hand, have a comb-like or feathery antenna. Um, let's see, I'll show you. Here is, this is a moth, this is a butterfly, okay? Their antenna are very different. Butterflies are not modified moths. Each one works amazingly well for all sorts of their sensory systems. How would it work in the meantime while it's transitioning from one to the other? If it works fine as is, why would it change? Did it improve? How could you study biology at the University of Texas and not know this? Butterflies and moths are not the same. Okay? There are lots of differences. Other taxonomic schemes have been proposed, but none of them is perfect. Both taxonomists and amateurs make use of the obvious difference between butterflies and moths. Go type in Google, it's G-O-O-G-L-E, and, and enter in the little line there, it says, what's the difference between butterflies and moths? There are many, many differences. They are not related. They look similar because the same guy designed them. His name is God, okay? <clears throat> wing coupling mechanisms. Moths have a system to couple their rear wing to their front wing. Remember we talked about that when we talked about some of the insects? They have a special system that couples the wings together. Butterflies don't have that. <clears throat> the hind wing can be coupled to the front wing. Special little clips or reticulum and a little frenulum that clips in there to hold the wings together to add stability. Butterflies don't have that. How, how long would it take for that to evolve? And if it did change from a moth to a butterfly, that's losing something, not gaining something. A moth and a butterfly can sure look alike, but they both and they both belong to the same insect family. Remember, it's kingdom, order, family, class. Uh, King Philip came over for Girl Scouts. Kingdom Philip, phylum, <laughs> kingdom phylum, <clears throat> order, family, uh, genus, species. So they look similar, but they're not the same. Okay, uh, you know the. Grand Marquis looks similar to the Chevy Caprice. They're not the same. Okay. <clears throat> there are a few differences to look for so you can tell them apart. Butterflies usually rest with their wings closed. Moths rest with their wings open. This is a butterfly. This is a moth. Okay. They're not the same. Pupa, the way that they go into the chrysalis stage or into the, uh, when they go through metamorphosis, most moths, moth caterpillars, spin a cocoon made of silk when they go into the pupa stage. Most butterflies, on the other hand, form an exposed pupa called a chrysalis. So the <clears throat> butterfly forms a chrysalis which is hard. There's the butterfly forming a chrysalis. The moths form a cocoon. They're not the same, Mr. Nelson. Okay, and you can't for you to just glibly say butterflies are modified moths. That's the kind of stuff students have to hear all day long, and it's just not true. You don't know your moth and butterfly anatomy. Color of the wings is different. Butterflies have extremely, oh here, most butterflies have bright colors on their wings. Nocturnal moths, on the other hand, are usually plain brown, gray, white, or black, and often with an obscuring pattern. Zigzags, or swirls, will help camouflage them as they fly during the day. So here is a butterfly, okay? Greek butterfly. Some butterfly wings are clear. They can see through them. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Okay. Butterflies have beautiful bright colored wings. The monarch butterfly and the crystal uh, goes through the stages there. And butter, you can study butterflies. They are not the same as moths. And for you to just glibly say that is silly. Look up, get a magnifying glass and look real close at a butterfly's wings and the amazing scale pattern. That's what you see under a magnifying glass or a microscope like we have right here. And you want me to believe this evolved by chance from an explosion of nothing. At the end, you're going to say, we don't believe they came from nothing. Well, then you don't believe your science textbooks because they all teach we came from nothing. You think this amazing design and pattern and the way each little scale, each little tiny scale attaches into the wing is mind-boggling. And some of them form pretty cool patterns. A, B, C, D, E, F, all the letters of the alphabet found, and the numbers found on butterfly wings. 
Who'd have thunk it? God speaks English, I guess. Okay. But the textbook says 18 or 20 billion years ago, all the matter in the universe, that will mean all the butterflies and all the moths, and you, Mr. Ra, uh, Nelson, was concentrated into one very hot, very dense region that may have been smaller than a period on... Can you imagine aren't being smaller than a period on a page? I will refrain from the obvious comments I could make, okay? Butterflies have a phenomenal anatomy. Study them for a while. Just the beak, just the, the nose, the proboscis, if you cut it in half, it's little tiny tubes. So they can suck in and out and they can roll the thing up. It is phenomenal. Their own little proboscis, a retractable straw that they can, they can actually steer the thing and go into the flower. Park on the flower and stick it in this one and go stick it in that one. They can, and it's, as long as their body. So all that stuff was in a dot smaller than a period on a page. Their eyeballs are mind-boggling. They'll have like 2,000 lenses. And all this came by chance from an explosion of nothing. This one has 12,000 eyes. A butterfly sees you through 12,000 eyes. Butterfly is one of the most beautiful creatures in the world with more than 15,000 species of butterflies. Hmm. They have an eye that you could probably study the rest of your life. It's mind-boggling, in my humble, totally unbiased opinion. So, the caterpillar makes a chrysalis, slowly turns into a butterfly inside. He starts off, no wings. His whole body goes in here and dissolves, and then all the molecules come back together into a butterfly. He didn't have any wings before. He had a whole bunch of legs, and now he's only got six. Didn't have the proboscis before, and now he's got a proboscis. Where did this information come from? How did it live while it was in the chrysalis stage? Hmm. And then they fly from Canada to Mexico, like millions and millions and millions of them. That's a long flight from Canada to Mexico. The ability to, first of all, the ability to fly at all let alone the ability to fly to Mexico. That means they got to go from English to Spanish. They'll know two languages, these butterflies do. <laughs> they go down there and land on the trees by the millions. I mean, they completely cover the trees down there. A friend of mine was a missionary down there in the, the spot where they land every winter. He said it just covers the trees. Look at this. Wow. That's butterflies. That's butterflies. Butterflies are not modified moths. Stop teaching something that dumb to anybody, okay? The structure of their body is different. Moths tend to have a stout and hairy or furry looking body. Butterflies, on the other hand, have slender and smoother abdomens. I will also refrain from the obvious comments I could make there, okay? <sighs> Short and hairy or smooth and slender, okay. Uh, Moths are not the same as butterflies. They have very different scale, scales, period. Very different uh, antenna. He said nearly, there are nearly a quarter million Lepidopterans, that would be the moth and butterfly family, but less than 50,000 of them are butterflies. Now, every little tiny word I say, you stop and pick at it, nearly a quarter of a million. Moths and butterflies constitute with nearly 160,000. I believe that's way less than a quarter million. And you said there are 50,000 of them are butterflies. Let's see. This one says 17,000 are butterflies. But hey, that's close to 50,000. You should work for the government, okay? The moth template. Now, what on earth is a template? All of them follow the moth template. Well, let's see. I thought I'd check that out. Uh, let's see. A template. A shaped piece of metal, wood, card, plastic, or other material used as a pattern for processes such as painting, cutting out, shaping, or drilling. Most of you that have done any construction at all know what a template is. Doesn't it usually indicate that the guy, somebody designs a template and then follows that pattern? Well, the Bible says God created the heaven and the earth. The Lord created the heavens. He said, I am the Lord and there is none else, Isaiah 45. In those days <clears throat> shall be affliction such as was not from the beginning of the creation which God created. He's claiming pretty clearly that he did it, Mr. Nelson. Okay, I know you don't like that, but the Bible certainly claims he did it. I know you don't believe the Bible yet. Okay. God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind. See, they follow a template. The living creatures live after their kind. 
the cattle, the creeping thing, the beast of the earth after his kind, and it was so. Oh. He said in the book of Ezekiel, Moses, I want you to do all this according to all that I show thee after the pattern of the tabernacle. The pattern. He gave them a template. Follow this pattern. Look that thou, and look that thou make them after their pattern, which was showed thee in the mount. See, if there's a template or a pattern that indicates a designer to do that. Howbeit for this cause I obtain mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to everlasting life. 1 Timothy 1. Howbeit for this cause is a pattern. God gives patterns all the time. God uses patterns. Have you ever seen a hairy pig before like that? I thought they were sheep for a second. I, that's, uh, <laughs> see, they have four legs and they have four legs. That's a template. That's a pattern that works really good so they can walk, right? And they have ears so they can hear. That's not proof of a common ancestor. That's proof of a common designer. That's a pattern that works pretty good. It's a template, okay? So this business of having templates. God uses patterns or templates all through nature. Does the moth even know he has those spots on his wings? Does he know they happen to look like an owl, which terrifies just about every other bird in the world? They're pretty near all terrified of the owls. Does the, moth, does the moth know? Did he make them show up there? Why aren't they square or triangle shaped? Why round? Is that a pattern? Uh, looks pretty reasonable to me. The chromosome studies of four species of moths. Moths belong to the order Lepidoptera, have high numbers of small size chromosomes. Hmm. 380 chromosomes? Someone wrote a book called DNA and Hereditary. It says butterflies have 380 chromosomes. I found the best article yet in Nature, which is a very famous science magazine. It says there's one group of butterflies where the number of chromosomes is different. It varies from 20 to 268. Well, chromosomes are pretty tiny. Here's a grain of salt compared to the eye of a needle, okay? Salt grains are pretty tiny. It takes three of them to equal about a millimeter. There's a grain of salt on a penny, okay? The human hair is about 0 0.06 millimeters across. Blonde hair, red hair, and brown hair are different sizes. Average blonde has about 100,000 hairs on their head. Average brunette has about 80,000. And average redhead has 60,000. And who cares? I just lost interest. So here's a normal hair, about 0.06 millimeters. A pencil, it would take about 100 hairs side by side to equal the width of a pencil. Okay. DNA molecules or chromosomes, one of the, probably the most complicated molecule in the world. I don't, I'm not aware of any that are more complicated than that. DNA molecule is two nanometers in diameter. Real tiny, okay? Real small. One millimeter is a, is a million nanometers. So let's see, a DNA molecule is two nanometers across. A millimeter is a million nanometers. 500,000 DNA strands would be one millimeter wide. Pretty tiny. And this is an unbelievably complex information. It would take eight and a third million DNA molecules to fit in a line across a normal human hair. The stump of one of your hairs would take eight and a third million DNA strands side by side laid out to be as wide as, as a hair. I don't think it's um, logical to say the DNA strands, the chromosomes, have, it could have happened by chance. Now, if you wish to believe that, that's fine, but you should not teach that at taxpayer expense to anybody, anywhere. Uh, Mr. Nelson, I think if all of them follow a moth template, you might want to consider the possibility that maybe they were all designed by the same guy. His name is God. Since each one is phenomenally complex, way more complex, a butterfly is more complex than the space shuttle. A butterfly is more complex than the entire New York City. That's a bad example. Uh, get something more organized, okay? Here we go, let's finish up here. And then of course, we have genetic sequencing to determine their familial relationship. So you have genetic sequencing to determine that they are related. Again, I would point out, if there's genetic sequencing that is similar, that doesn't prove a relationship. How many lines of code are there in Microsoft Word that are identical to the lines of code in Microsoft PowerPoint? 
hundreds of thousands of identical lines of code. That doesn't prove a common ancestor. Why can't you guys see that? I know you want very badly to be related to the apes, I understand, but that it's not true, okay? Certainly not science. As this article explains, that's easier than it used to be because we can get reliable data sets in mere months, but it can take years to train researchers to be proficient in morphological character analysis. So we can get the, we can get the data in months, but it takes years to train them. Let me interpret that. To train them to believe in evolution and to learn if they publish anything that goes against evolution, they will lose their job. That's what it takes years to teach them how to do. That's right, that's right. Yeah, think about that. Okay. Broccoli is a human invention. Expl Broccoli is a human invention. You have <laughs> got to be kidding. <laughs> think about that just for a couple minutes. Broccoli is not a human invention. Let me explain this to you. Okay. Broccoli is a human invention. When I was doing my series, which I will continue if I get time, I went through the A's and said, how could this possibly evolve? And I went through the B's, one of which I mentioned was broccoli. Broccoli is not a human invention. Let me explain it to you carefully, Mr. Nelson. Broccoli is one of many different plants that has been derived from the wild mustard plant. They say there must be the same biblical kind. I believe they're probably the same kind of plant. Certainly they're a plant, okay? They're not a whale, they're not a bird, it's a plant. What they did, they took the wild mustard plant and selectively bred to get more larger terminal buds and they ended up with cabbage. Then they, somebody else said, no, I want more f stems and flowers. So they kept breeding and breeding and crossbreeding and selecting for flowers and stems and they ended up with broccoli. See, humans did not invent broccoli, Mr. Nelson. They selected an already existing slice of gene code from a plant. They started with a plant, they ended up with a plant. But they selected, just like people selected dogs to get the smaller and smaller and smaller ones till you get one like beans that's completely useless, okay? And, but friendly, okay? So, what happened over, over the decades and maybe even centuries, people selected a particular trait to get either, they, here, they selected for the stem or the leaf or the flower buds or the lateral leaf or the terminal bud or the flower bud and they've ended up with all these plants, and I don't think anybody disagrees, they all came from a common ancestor. Humans did not create broccoli. <sighs> broccoli is not a human invention. Humans selected a small slice of an already existing gene code. You see, the, bro the original plant already had leaves. They selected it to get more leaves. Oh, okay or they already had little stems or buds or whatever it was, they can select for more and more of one of those. But the further they get away from the normal wild mustard plant, the more problems you have. Each one of these plants, cabbage, Brussels sprout, kale, all of them, has to be, you have to babysit it. They plant them in the field. In the wild, they wouldn't survive very long. They would go back to their wild original one because they've selected one trait that they wanted, but it's now weaker and they didn't add any genetic information at all. They selected a slice of already existing information. They, you, you could select for bigger dogs or smaller dogs, but you cannot put wings on the dog. It's not in the gene code to have a dog fly, okay? There are horse flies, but that's very different. You cannot get a dog fly, I've never heard of a dog fly. So, they did not, humans did not invent or create broccoli. How could you study biology at the University of Texas and not know this? Humans, some teacher lied to you. You should go back and get your money back. Now, let's finish up here. Exploiting evolutionary mechanisms in agriculture by selective breeding and to derive broccoli and cauliflower out of an early form of kale. You got it. It's not a human invention. It's a human selection. You know, they've selected cows. They have some cows that give more milk. They have some cows that have more beef. They have some cows that can stand the heat better, like the Brahma. They have selected a slice of an existing gene code from the cow. It's still a cow. 
when I was in Kankakee, I took my students to a farm where they happened to have that year the world record holder for giving the most milk. One cow we saw gave a hundred pounds of milk a day. Wow. Utterly ridiculous. <laughs> but the thing could barely walk. Wouldn't survive in nature one day. <laughs> Gee whiz. That's eight pounds a gallon. Okay. How did you not know this already? I did know that already. You're the one who didn't know that, okay? How did you not know that already? <laughs> you think this is inexplicable? Hey, where's that sand thing that makes the different... Uh... Who's got playing with There we go. Here. Mr. Nelson, you need to see and play with this for a while to understand ge geology, and you need to look at this once in a while to understand who doesn't understand, okay? <laughs> what would it take to get you to admit this mistake? What would it take to get me to admit this mistake? First of all, it's not a mistake. What would, what's it going to take to get you to admit your mistake, Mr. Nelson? You're the one that's mistaken. Humans did not invent broccoli or any other plant. They selected it from an already existing, really complex gene code. Would it be possible to open up a computer code like Microsoft PowerPoint and select a section of the lines of code and do one particular thing? Sure, they do that all the time, right? You're selecting a slice of existing code. How did you not know that about the broccoli? Hey, Anthony, you like to cook broccoli? If Mr. Nelson came down to visit Dinosaur, would you cook him some broccoli, please? Okay. Calm down. Okay. Here we go. More. And sadly, you think that anything that science can't explain is somehow explained by your God's magic? That's well, this is called a logical fallacy, Mr. Nelson. You give two options, neither of which is correct necessarily. A logical fallacy. You're good about pointing those things out. That's like me saying, are elephants pink or orange? How about, how, how, how about neither one? Maybe there's a third option. It, logical fallacy. It, if science can't explain it, therefore God did it with magic. That's the two choices you give. Well, there's a third choice. Science hasn't understood it yet. We're still studying it. Look, look, I love science. And there are scientific explanations for all sorts of things. It's not magic that these molecules are held together to make this glass. And water is not magic. Okay? It's got an ionic bonding, hydrogen, hydrogen, oxygen molecules bonded together, 105 degree angle. And the, if it wasn't 105 degrees, if it was 180, like you would think it would, since you know, likes repel, except in San Francisco, or attract. So uh, if you made it where the oxygen molecule, the water molecule was oxygen and two hydrogens, it would line up and freeze solid, and ice wouldn't float. Lakes would freeze from the bottom up, and everything would die. But because of that 105 degree angle, as, ice, as water freezes into ice, it expands 12% and ice floats. Almost all other liquids shrink when they freeze. Water doesn't. Who designed that? I don't have a problem saying, praise God for water and ice. God, you're smart. See, my knees bow to him right now. Yours will. Not true either. You have to justify your position. I have to justify my position. I'm not forcing everybody to pay for my position to be taught. You evolutionists are the guys that have to justify your position. Don't put the burden of proof on me. If I was requiring everybody to teach my religion, then yeah, the burden of proof would be on me. I'm not doing that. But you guys got it in the public schools where if somebody doesn't want to pay for it, they come take away your house because it's all supported by the real estate taxes for the house. Property taxes, yeah. You also mentioned bears, which are closely related to both dogs and seals. Slow down. Slow down. <laughs> bears. Bears are closely related to dogs and seals. Well, here we go. Right here. Slide number 96. Uh, you can't make this stuff up. I mean... <laughs> Did your parents have any children that lived? Okay. Um, 
Bears and seals and dogs are related. Let's see. Let me explain it to you. Let, let, let me, uh, quiet so you can get this now. Okay, pay attention. This is a seal. This is a bear, okay? <laughs> this is a bear, and these are seals over here. Not Navy seals now. There's a couple, and not the kind you put on an envelope. There's a couple different meanings for the word seal, just like there's a couple different meanings for the word evolution, okay? The Bible says clearly that God made everything. God's claiming he made it all. But in Romans chapter 1, it says, Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Mr. Nelson, you know full well there's a God and he made it. And you want to believe that bears and seals and dogs are related. For heaven's sake, you need a little, a little more education. I'll tell you what, we could start a college right here. Kent Hovind University. Come on down. I'll teach you a couple things, okay? The Bible says they became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. So God gave them up. You know, God gives up on people. Kind of like you knock on somebody's door and they don't answer, so you give up and you go to the next door. So God says, hey, anybody home? And you don't answer, okay. God gave them up, it says in verse 26. God gave them over to a reprobate mind. We have fossil transitions of bears becoming seals, you said. Now slow down. Stop with the rah-rat run and think about it for a minute, okay? Bears, polar bears, brown bears, black bears, American black bear, have 74 chromosomes. I suspect they had a common ancestor. A guinea pig, that's right. Now, broccoli, they all came from broccoli. Anybody can't see the similarity. They're all green except for the bears. Hello, okay, now, how many chromosomes do seals have? Well, let's see, 32. Well, let me see if I got this right. Bears have 74, seals have 32. Explain where this extra information is coming from. Steve, you've been working on computers for a long time. Do any computer programs automatically gain new information? I mean, like whole new millions of lines of code all of a sudden shows up. So you're typing away in, you know, Microsoft Word, and up comes all the instructions to build an airplane. And, the, and it's not in the code, okay? 32 is different than 74, Mr. Nelson. I also taught mathematics, algebra, geometry, trig. If you want to have a quiz on those, I can help you. Now, dogs have 78. So bears have 74. Seals have 32. Dogs have 78. You want to think they're related, you're welcome to believe anything you want to believe. But that's not common sense. It's certainly not science. You said we have evidence showing their divergence in the fossil record. Let me point out something that I think should be obvious. Fossils don't talk. They don't have a date on them. They don't come with an instruction manual. You dig up a bone in the dirt and you put your interpretation on that. Secondly, I'd like to point out the obvious. Fossils, you can't prove they had any children. You certainly couldn't prove they had different children. Why is it no bear today is capable of producing anything other than a bear? And no seal is capable of producing anything other than a seal. But you think a bone in the dirt could do something that no bear or seal today could do. You have incredible faith. I greatly admire you evolutionist faith. I do not admire your intelligence, but I do admire your faith. That's incredible. And then you had the gumption <clears throat> to say, none of these things came from nothing. Hold on, that is exactly what you believe. I've been saying this over and over 62 times now. Let me do it once more to the dismay of the listening audience here in the room. I started with ant lions as an example. Let's see, a dot of nothing exploded and became everything, which would include the bear and the seal and the dog. I'm sorry, it wasn't an explosion, my mistake. It was a rapid expansion. And the stars are not getting farther apart, one guy told me. 
the distance between them is increasing. <laughs> oh, okay, I'm sorry, I misunderstood. Okay. <laughs> I'm serious. You remember that? <laughs> the most important info that few people know. The universe is 13.798 and what, 11 weeks old. That was 11 weeks ago they told me this. Okay. It is a sphere with a calculated diameter of 93 billion light years. Well, then, if it's only 13 or 14 billion years old, how did it get 93 billion light years across? Did the stars move faster than the speed of light? Do the math. The universe has 500 billion galaxies and 7 trillion dwarf galaxies and a whole bunch of stars. Okay. Virtual particles that convey temporary mass continuously pop in and out of existence. Where are they when they're gone? I would like a jar of them. Mm -hmm. The nothingness, the between the ears of the evolutionist. No, I'm sorry, between the quarks. Ninety percent of you, including what's between your ears, is nothing. The universe formed by matter, condensing out of the energy of an inflating singularity 13.798 billion years ago. You came from energy. You are energy. All matter came from energy. The inflating singularity that formed the universe came from nothing. Yes, you do think you came from nothing. The singularity was an unstable, ultra-high energy virtual particle that spontaneously appeared out of the nothingness of a quantum vacuum. Was it a Kirby? <laughs> you come from nothing. Everything comes from nothing. Wow. Hi, I'm James St. John, University of Ohio. Alan Guth, our favorite quote. The, obs the observable universe could have evolved from an infinitesimal region. It's then tempting to go one step further and step over the edge of the cliff. <laughs> or, never mind. I was going to say step in it. <clears throat> the, you know, the bovine excrement. Okay. Speculate that the entire universe evolved from literally nothing. Yes, you think you came from nothing. Why would you say that you don't believe that? That is what the books teach. Let's continue here. Also have bear dogs and dog bears showing their divergence in the fossil record. You don't see, it. fossils don't talk. You're putting your interpretation on these. Nobody sees a bear produce a non-bear, a dog produce a non-dog, and we don't know that they're related. They have vastly different chromosome numbers. They look a little similar because the same guy designed them all. Name is then, God. On top of that, we even have genome sequence, comparative analysis, and half. You have genome sequence. Okay. Well, what about the chromosome difference? Now he's going to state here in a minute that we can prove cats and dogs, but he uses, of course, the big word for it. ...type structure of the domestic dog, which links them not just to other breeds of dogs, but to other species of dogs that can't... Wow. We can, we can link them to other species of dogs. See, he's stuck on this word species. That's what Charles Darwin was. The Bible says they bring forth after their kind. Charlie Darwin wrote the book over there called The Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection or the Preservation of Favored Life. Uh, Favored races uh, in the struggle for life. Okay. They're still the same kind. It's called a dog. And then you think that's evidence dogs and cats are related. Cats have retractable claws. Dogs don't. Where did those extra muscles come from? As well as a million other differences. Interbreed and would therefore be different kinds in your illusion. This same genetic study also links dogs to bears as well as seals. If you're doing a genetic study to link the dogs and bears and seals, explain the chromosome number difference. They're vastly different. And then we have additional genetic evidence in a molecular phylogeny of the carnivora, linking all conoidia and phylloidia. Whoa, they're all linked. You're not going to believe this now. They drew lines on paper. That proves they're related. So none of these things came from nothing. Multiple lines of evidence indicate that they all came from prior forms. The I agree they all came from prior forms. I agree the dogs came from prior forms of dog. I think the dogs you see today probably had parents that were dogs and grandparents that were dogs and probably great grandparents that were dogs. They come from a long line of dogs, okay? And the bears come from a long line of bears. That's where it stops. There's you dream this SpongeBob imagination stuff, fairy tale. Oh, just think about it. If you go back millions of years, can't you see the similarity between a seal and a dog? No. 
mechanism of population genetics that you already accept as legitimate and that we've been using throughout agriculture since the dawn of civilization. Correct. Listen carefully to what you just said. We've been using through the, all, throughout agriculture since the dawn of civilization, people have been selecting certain things to grow in certain areas because they do better. Farmers work very hard to grow corn in different types of climates. I come from Illinois, corn country, corn all over the place up there. They have corn that grows in slightly damp soil, places that stay wet longer. They have corn that grows on hillsides better than it does in the valleys with drain, drain soil. They have corn that grows up further north and further south. There are about, I don't know how many different varieties of corn there are, but it's a whole bunch. They've developed, by selecting a slice of the gene code, they've developed different sheep that do different things. Some survive, some give more wool, some give more meat, some give more babies. They're still sheep. They're, you're right, Mr. Nelson, since the dawn of civilization, farmers have worked very hard to develop varieties best for their area. Aren't those of you planting the plants around here? This is zone eight. Certain things don't grow here in zone eight. Certain things do. Anthony, did you say you had some kind of you did gardening experience, right? Yeah. How many varieties of apples are there? Hundreds. Hundreds. If, not thousands. if not thousands. And they came from an ancestor called broccoli. I'm sorry, Mr. Nelson, we've taken a whole lot of time and covered 18 minutes of your supposed to be giving me the three best evidences for evolution. I haven't, I haven't heard them yet, but they're coming and I'm enjoying going line by, sometimes word by word, and dismantling your lies and your misunderstandings. It's a shame somebody has to do that, but guys like you, by the thousands, are teaching college classes all over the place. Somebody said, those who can't do, teach. <laughs> oh, I don't know if that's true or not, but um, you have no clue that a dog is related to a seal. You believe that very strongly, and I admire your faith. But that's not science. And humans did not invent broccoli. It was a slice of an existing gene code. So what I would like is any of you people who have teachers that are giving you a hard time like this, teaching you stuff like this, evolution in school, give, say, teacher, this is kind of unfair to have teacher versus student. After all, you have an academic advantage over me. You're going to give me a grade. You could fail me. And you could hurt my career. That's not nice, that's not fair for you to have this academic advantage. You have a psychological advantage. Your teacher, you know the big words. I'm lowly student. How about, let's call Kent Hovind. I will do a Skype interview like I did today with the guy in Germany. Let's do a Skype interview right there with your class for free. We will do a Skype interview and I'll take on the teacher. And we'll go one sentence at a time, one thought at a time one a paragraph, if whatever is necessary, certainly one topic at a time. I'll take them on. Because what you have to do with guys like Mr. Nelson who ramble on and on and on and on and on and on, you got to stop, hold it, stop right there. Let's analyze what you just said. Let's, no, that's not correct. Before you run off and give the raw rat run, let's just slow it down and take it like, now I'm going to do the same with your three evidences for evolution. And I think when this is done, you're going to be real sorry you agreed to this thing where I can hit pause on you because you're used to running right over your opponents. Well, you're not going to run over this one. I'm not the least bit afraid, and I intend to continue. If it takes another week, we're going to finish this. Now, fan, please. Tune in tomorrow, folks, for session five. Thank you for joining us. Push thumbs up, like us, subscribe. Come visit Dinosaur Adventureland. See it, ring the bell. See you tomorrow. Bye.